Okay, good morning. It is 9.15, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, yeah, we're just going to dive right in. So good morning, everyone. It's great to see some of you here in person. And to those of you who are joining us online, thanks for joining us virtually. Uh, today, we're here to talk about two simple methods that we've deployed whenever we're reporting on our data that have led to increased research engagement. So these methods have served us pretty well, both in our roles as player researchers and user researchers in-house, but also now working as a vendor. But first, who are we? Uh, so I'm Josh Rivers. I'm the UX research lead at Solston, where we provide audience insights and research as a service. This is supported by kind of harnessing the power of machine learning and psychometric data. If you're curious about that, see me afterwards. Uh, but prior to that, I actually worked on EVE Online, uh, was working at CCP Games in Iceland, also worked on EVE Echoes. And I'm Joachim Schiavo. I'm a senior player researcher at Solsten, uh, where I'm working alongside Josh, uh, where we deliver high quality research to the various gaming companies um, in the industry. And before that, before joining Solsten about a year ago, I was working also at CCP Games in Iceland as with Josh as well. So like I said, we'll be talking about two unique reporting methods today, research nuggets and critical insights readers. Uh, I'll start by walking us through research nuggets, including actually a how-to on them and why we came to use them in the first place. So giving a bit of context and also talking about the method. And I'll be getting us through the latter half of the talk where we dive into the critical insights readers, what they are, and how they are particularly useful when working as a vendor, a freelancer, or a contractor. So with that said, let's dive in. So to understand how to turn disengagement into enthusiasm, let's start at the very beginning. A handful of you may remember my pandemic era talk on bridging the gap between academia and game development teams. I'm not here to plug that talk, I promise. Uh, I just mention it because a part of my aim with that whole method in the framework that I tried to develop there was to connect the ivory tower to game developers. And it worked for the more research inclined folks on the CCP games team. But one thing I didn't mention in that talk, and I'll, I'm happy to talk about it now, is that uh, even when following that kind of four step method of, you know, distilling down the academic work into something actionable, uh, most people didn't really read it. Uh, so it just created kind of more lengthy reports, things that people were interested in, but always said they didn't have time because in their own words, hey, we're really interested in getting back to making Eve online. Now, don't get me wrong, those developers were right. Uh, the goal of a game team, after all, is to make games. And our job as researchers is to help them make the best games possible through data-informed decision-making processes. So that's really oversimplifying things a bit, uh, but you get the gist. So it happened that at CCP Games, uh, I started by kind of synthesizing findings from academic work or from my own studies and then combine that with uh, you know, the bits from uh, in-person work or virtual work during the pandemic and created really, really thorough reporting work. So really lengthy things with lots of context, great insights, I thought, and almost no one read it. Uh, I give credit to the producer level uh, at CCP Games specifically. Uh, those folks probably spent far too much time poring over my reports, especially on the internal wiki, uh, but I'm relatively sure they were the only ones. The game designers weren't taking time to read it. The engineers weren't, uh, the QA folk maybe, but in general, people weren't taking the time because it was really, really heavy. So, uh, I'm relatively sure they weren't were the only ones reading it, mostly because uh, one time I actually ended up asking a team member on a team I was on. Uh, he was responsible for creating mission content for new players. And I, I went and asked and said, hey, actually, we just presented on this. Uh, did you get anything useful from it? Did you take anything away? Uh, and he said, uh, and I quote, yeah, oh, uh, I started working on my stuff weeks ago. These studies are like really slow. They just slow everything down. And to be honest, the language, it can be really hard to interpret. So this is a game designer telling this to me directly. Uh, and color me surprised, dear viewers, considering the language was, new players found the instructions of the second exploration mission difficult to understand and wanted more guidance on how to equip the modules needed in order to engage with the exploration mini game before being sent to exploration sites in space. Now it's lengthy, but it was pretty direct. So clearly there was a problem. While my reports could be bulky, my presentations, I really tried to make them not so bulky, really minimal bullet points, trying to get straight to the point of here's the hurdle, here's maybe where we can fix something for new players. I worked hard to keep the content concise, but still thorough. 
And still in this case, and in a few other cases too, I would see developers attend the results presentation and just watch as eyes glazed over. They'd eventually turn this into the sentiment that we just heard of, yeah, this took a lot of time and it's hard for me to interpret what to do with this. The problem though, I figured, wasn't so much the time or the results, but actually it was the way in which I was presenting it to the teams. And so I went in search of alternative reporting methods. I found a few interim solutions and ultimately just kind of accepted my faith that, hey, maybe people won't actually listen to what I'm saying all the time, but some of it gets through at some level. So ultimately, I actually stumbled across, though, in an entirely different context, uh, Tomer Sharon's our Medium article titled The Atomic Unit of a Research Insight. This was actually an entirely different mission I was on. It was about how to store the reports internally, and that I'm happy to talk about as well later. Uh, but I would encourage you to actually go read this article. It's short and it's pretty interesting. Uh, to be honest, though, what caught my attention most about it was this giant image of chicken nuggets at the top. Uh, so throughout the piece, Sharon actually talks about distilling down the output of UX research to its, as you can imagine, atomic unit or indivisible part, and how our reports are not the atomic units of research, but rather our nuggets are. Those nuggets, uh, in his words, are uh, observations gathered through research. So he argues that an insights repository properly tagged with thousands of individual nuggets beats any report. I, I don't actually entirely agree, but that's not what this first part of our talk is about. In fact, it is all about those chicken nuggets. So you see, that image actually stuck with me. Uh, it haunted my thoughts, and I'm pretty sure I actually ended up dreaming about chicken nuggets a time or two when I was working on this. Uh, and I really wanted to, to, to somehow harness this. And then one day it struck me, that's actually what I needed to do for my development teams in order to get research to stick with them. Haunt their dreams with chicken nuggets. So I'm obviously joking to an extent. I mean, I did want to haunt their dreams, but uh, with images and memories of players and player experiences. Instead of images though, I thought about what had worked early on with the team when I was first starting there, watching players experience the game. So as we know, getting the team to watch play tests is one of the most powerful tools we have in our toolkit. But with many of my teams, and especially when working in Iceland with North American players specifically, schedules just never quite lined up. Unless I wanted to drag study timelines out or have people stay up super late, which in Iceland was a huge no, um, so it was just not going to work. So I, I devised something that maybe would work instead, and that is the nugget. Uh, my own take on it, which was just a short clip highlighting hurdles or successes from the studies I did. I'd give each one a unique title too, kind of in the hopes that this would stick with the team. So similar to those chicken nuggets haunting my dreams. Each nugget was meant to kind of haunt the, the experience of our designers as they were building things out. So what we're going to do now is actually watch one of these nuggets. Uh, it's called That's So Sick. This is from EVE Online. And it's all about mission rewards. Hopefully that works. Nope. Just a moment, we'll have to figure out how this works. Sorry, go ahead. Of course. Okay. We're trying to go left. I should have received the new ship if I understood the mission correctly. Okay. Which I did. Oh, wow, that's so sick. And, and tell me how that makes you feel. Uh, it's pretty sweet. I won't lie. But so, like, it's cool. But at the same time, it makes me wonder, like, will I always be getting my ships this way? Do they always come through missions, or am I? Do I need to purchase them with 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 money? Uh, do I need to, you know, sink real money into the game to get cool ship? All right. So that was the nugget, and it accomplishes two things. So you don't see the player's face, but the dev team actually did. Uh, we're doing that for anonymization reasons and uh, data consent. I will get back in a second. All good. Um, but you can hear their joy at receiving that ship, right? So this helped the team kind of connect to players and success moments in the game, but then following right after, so, okay, that's so sick, this is great, there's that hurdle the player experienced in the new player experience of EVE Online. So you see the celebratory moment, but you also take away what that struggle was, and it, it worked, especially with that team. Uh, this kind of reporting, just showing these nuggets, kind of highlighting the theme from the research and then saying what the hurdle was, helped them connect to research results. 
Uh, so we went from, oh, I guess there was a study done on mission rewards to, yeah, let's create more that's so sick moments. And this is how people talked about it internally, which was great. All right, uh, you're probably thinking, great, but uh, what does this matter? I'm not a developer for EVE Online, and that's true, but you can take away basically the, the process here. And that's what we're going to walk through now. Uh, so let's dive into that. We would love to show you more from EVE Online, uh, but many of those nuggets are under lock and key. So we're going to use a pretend session that Joey Keem and I actually created on the uh, World of Warcraft Fatui as the basis for our how-to. So let's imagine you're running a moderated study looking for pain points in that Fatui. One session could easily take 30 to 45 minutes. Mine took 36 minutes, uh, about exactly. It could also take more. And the aim is to take that session, that full recording, and distill it down into 15 to 45 second clips into nuggets. Moments that highlight either key hurdles or successes in player experiences with whatever it is that you're testing. So here, for example, we actually boiled down my interview with Joachim into three key nuggets. We're going to watch the first one only, eyes for inventory, but uh, if the WoW team is here and you want to see those others, I'm happy to share them. Uh, so let's go ahead and watch that now. Some shoes. Okay. I would so, probably try to equip them. Yeah, how would you do that? I'm going to hit I because I is for inventory, and that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Backpack, maybe down here. Shift B. Yep. And then to equip those, I click. I right clicked it because that's what we do in Final Fantasy. Okay. Um, and that seemed to work here. And then my all sure. shoes went down there. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, oh, B also works. All right. Uh, so. Uh, as you can see, the inventory was a struggle for me. And to be clear, it was a real struggle for me. I actually really did expect the I key to open the inventory there. But I did eventually discover that B did the same, same job after a few moments of frustration. So here, that nugget is kind of highlighting the expected behavior and then figuring out how it actually works. Uh, basically distilling down the theme of the research from some players struggle with inventory hotkeys to I is for inventory for people. Let's think about how to badge this a little bit better. Of course, this is all fake data. This is not a real study. This is just meant to kind of highlight the point, but it shows you how we get from that 36 minutes down to just a 32 second research nugget. And to do that, we follow a four step process. Let's see if it's going to. So let's dive into how to create your own nuggets. The first step is to do your research, collect your data to find your key themes and observations. I hope it's obvious that you actually should work from like the data process first. You're not going and finding the nuggets and then making the data say what the nuggets say. It's actually finding themes and observations and then kind of mining your recordings, which is step number two, to find recorded moments where players express whatever that theme was, or it's observable as well. There were definitely a few nuggets where no one spoke, but you could just see the kind of clicks of frustration that we worked with. So once you've identified the insights, like I said, you mine the recordings of your play sessions, interviews, or focus groups for moments when players best kind of speak to your insider theme. Uh, in short, you've kind of uncovered this insight, right? So now find where it's explicitly kind of mentioned, celebrated, or expressed. So hopefully, and this should hopefully go without saying, uh, recordings are important to the nugget process. And ideally, you are recording your data anyways. But if you're, that doesn't, if that's not possible, if data collection doesn't allow that, or there's kind of an, you know, some privacy concerns, you could do a written nugget. And I don't talk about that, but um, from my background in anthropology, we have this thing called thick description. Happy to chat about that afterwards, but you could also kind of write up just a really clear moment of celebration, kind of an ethnographic written nugget as well. We'll go into that a little bit later though. So uh, you mine the recordings, you figure out when the timestamp is, right, in that recording for the moment or celebration that kind of covers the point. And then step three, and this is the most involved, you actually make your clips using a video editing software. You're gonna whittle it down to 15 to 45 seconds. And we're gonna go more into step three. This is a very involved process and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But at the end, you have step four, which is just to share your nugget. So you're gonna embed your clip either in a presentation and recording, and you're gonna share that out to the team. One thing that worked really well for me as well, and uh, spoiler alert, it's a little bit about how we got to Critical Insights readers, is sharing nuggets ahead of the presentation. So, hey, I just want you to see this, this moment, this, this thing that we're gonna talk about whenever we're actually kind of uh, in the full presentation mode. But let's go back to step three. So how does this all work? 
Well, there are actually two methods that I generally use. Uh, the first is the one that I use a lot, which is Adobe Premiere Pro. It's a little bit faster. Uh, it's a little bit more you know, precise. It also allows for anonymization. And then the second one, the one I'll actually talk through today is using VLC player. It's free. Adobe Premiere Milk Pro is not free. So we're going to go through what's a little bit more accessible, especially if you're just starting out. Uh, the steps for Adobe Premiere Pro, I'm sorry about the formatting, uh, it's, it's quite complicated. So there's only five here on this slide, but it's really about a 20 step process. And again, happy to talk about that a little bit later. But VLC player is, is much more easy. It's about seven, seven steps. So I'm going to now talk through those steps, and then we're going to watch the video how to, and I'll talk through them again. The first step, you're going to open the recording in VLC player. The second is you have to make sure that advanced controls are shown in VLC player. Uh, you do that by right-clicking the bar and then clicking advanced controls. That allows you to see a record button. Then you're going to use playback to jump to your Nuggets timestamp, or you can just navigate there as well. Uh, the fourth step, you just click record. Then you click play and watch the nugget actually happen. So you do have to watch that whole clip with VLC player. Adobe Premiere Pro, you don't have to actually watch. And then you're going to click pause and then record again once that nugget is done. And then step seven is just go to your videos folder. You're going to find the nugget uh, as a clip and then give it a fancy title and voila. So let's watch how to do this. And again, I'll actually talk through this as we, we watch this clip. So here we are opening VLC player, pulling that recording session in. This is the whole recording. Great pause frame, right? Uh, then we're going to go to the playback. Uh, actually, sorry, first advanced controls. Make sure that's shown. You can now see the record button and that bottom. For those of you watching online, it's not visible, but it is going to be in the bottom left. And then you're going to actually use this tool playback to go to a specific timestamp when that clip starts. So here we're putting in the timestamp. Uh, and then you're going to wait for that to all happen. <laughs> that's going to jump there. So now we're at the actual clip. You're going to click record. I got some shoes. OK. I would probably so, try to equip them. Yeah, how would you do that? I'm going to hit I because I is for inventory. And that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So um, backpack, maybe, down here. Shift B. Yep. And then to equip those. I click. I right clicked it because that's what we do in Final Fantasy. OK. Um, and that seemed to. So then you're going to stop that clip wherever you're ready to stop the, the nugget. You're going to click record again. Then you're going to go to your videos folder. And there is the nugget. And then you just rename that nugget. And uh, that's some go. shoes. I'm gonna watch it. Okay. Again. I would probably so, try to equip them. Yeah. How would you do that? I'm gonna hit I because I is for inventory, and that doesn't work. So, um... all right. And that is basically how you make a nugget with VLC player. Uh, we're not gonna watch that again. Uh, yeah. I'm just gonna go down here. Uh, and so again, just to summarize it all up, the point of these nuggets really is to take those long recordings uh, and actually connect players' voices to your themes to then hand over to the development team. Again, it's putting players in front of developers through just a much more streamlined process of giving them kind of a bite-sized clip to walk away from that they can then connect to whatever the hurdle or celebration was with the data you're working with. So that is Nuggets. Uh, now we're going to go over to Joachim, who's going to tell us a little bit about another reporting method we deploy, especially at Solston. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. So is that OK? Yeah, is that working? Oh, good. Sorry, just hiccup. <laughs> Uh, now let's talk about how to drive curiosity and build empathy with dev teams using a two-step reporting process. So um, when Josh and I uh, used to work at CCP Games in Iceland, uh, we were embedded researchers working closely with dev teams um, on the EVE Online. At Solstein, we became external researchers. <clears throat> Sorry, we became external researchers um, working with different teams, uh, working with external teams. Um, but what did it change for us when interacting with those different dev teams? 
a research team inside a studio will be, of course, closer to the developers, implying a higher engagement with the projects and working with colleagues as employee of the same entity. Technically, it's working in the same team, but we know that the bridge between dev engagement and research can be quite important to bridge. Therefore, as Josh mentioned um, in the previous part, the use of nuggets was a strong bond between the research team and the dev teams and the dev teams we worked with and helping to build trust. But at Sultan, the context is different. Working as external researchers. So we are now external researchers and we cannot advocate for our research in the same fashion. We need to provide proof and evidence to dev teams um, that they can trust us to deliver a high quality report in the minimum time possible. But the trust gap is even larger and we need to advocate for our research, stressing all the advantages uh, that they will have if they conduct research with us. Um, for instance, with deep dive into their audience, involve, having an involved research team ready to answer any question they might have. Um, and also, of course, help them craft the best experience possible. And this trust, especially when you meet with a team for the first time, needs to be earned. <clears throat> Sorry. Therefore, we explored ways to immediately build a strong relationship with our clients, making sure the journey with them is going to be the most enjoyable possible for them, as well as being included in the study process. But what we learn and how we change our processes. So clients like to be informed throughout the process of what's happening during a study. And they ask about how things are going, the delays, any other questions they might have um, regarding the study itself. Good communication is key. And we were good communicators, but we also noticed that nothing beats having valuable results in clients' hands as soon as possible, of course. The report being a conclusion to the study, <clears throat> we needed a solution to bridge the time gap between study end and also uh, between the data while we are building still a solid relationship. This is why we'll build this two-step reporting process and with a specific document, the Critical Insights Reader. So what is a Critical Insights Reader? Um, the CIR is a document gathering the high-level insights captured during the first day of a study. It's a short document, not exceeding four pages, focused on delivering precise data. How do we craft this? So after the start of any study, usually after three days, we start analyzing the preliminary data that we have gathered. Either it's from surveys, from Plato's video, or any like different sources that we might have like gathered. Uh, we then give a sample of playtesters representative of the audience to craft the documents and giving the team a broad representation of their players um, ahead of the full data analysis. I've already covered that in part, but I'm going to add some details about the why do we do this. So working quickly matters, especially in the mobile gaming landscape, where most clients will like to have results before the study started. You think this document uh, serves us and the dev teams on multiple levels. So first, it helps with building empathy. So clients appreciate a team that is invested in their work and shows eagerness bridging the trust gap is also a mission as researchers. So not only because it helps strengthen the relationship between us, but also because it starts the process of empathy bridging between the team and the players. It's also about managing expectations. Working quickly is key to success uh, as a vendor, of course, uh, offering research services, and most studios ask to have their study uh, results delivered as fast as possible. Using this document helps drive curiosity while also giving the team something to chew on of, ahead of the full report being delivered, which for us usually happens a week after the CIR. We also want to build trust when the studio notices our commitment to deliver quickly. Um, we, we provide us the CIR um, in a very timely manner. So they are not only happy, they know they can now trust us in doing our jobs really fast, and we deliver high quality documents as well. And engage, uh, finally engage our stakeholders. Trust, trust, empathy, and curiosity are great, but it's also essential to keep our clients engaged with the process throughout the whole study. So in that manner, we can break the ice with them 
um, and answer any questions about the study or initial results that they might have and have a relationship that will develop and grow throughout the future. Now I'm going to present to you one of our own CIR. So please keep in mind that all this data is fake. As explained before, the CIR is a document that, we'll, that we deliver to the dev teams a few days after gathering the complete data. It is structured that way. So the introduction sets the context and presents the document to the team and outlining also the work that follows. Then we dive into the critical insights. What are the top highlights that the team needs to know so far? And what are the main findings as well? Sometimes we include a couple of metrics tied to the experience of the game, as you can see here as well. The second page will then give details on the critical insights discovered, tying the insights to a quote usually, and um, any explanation of the insights context as well. The last page is optional, depending on the study focus, but it's, it can present the different metrics measured during the playtest. I'm going to now show you how to create those documents so you can then see how it's being crafted. So the methodology. So the first step is to create a framework. So depending on the study type um, and the amount of data collected, of course, we create pages according to our needs. The step to, sec, second step is going to be to organize the contents. So if we need something specific, uh, like specific materials, graphs, boards, um, depending on the number of players as well, we will need to create those and tailor them to the design, making sure that the design serves the purpose of the story being told in the document. The story itself. What do we want our document to tell our clients? What, were there any specific requests on there and something that they wanted to see that is going to be essential for, it, for them? And we want to be sure that the CR will not only give them high level insights, but also be remembered when we're going to deep dive into the report. The data. Analyzing and coding the primary data, of course, uh, that we have gathered is critical. Using our different tools, we will use quant and qual methodologies to have the top insights to give to the team. We then add this data to the document. Uh, now that it has been coded uh, and we have gathered everything we need, uh, we can start crafting the document by adding relevant information to it. Step six is going to be the insights and recommendations. Um, depending on the type of CIR, we not always do this. We can already include some predimin predimin I hate this word, sorry. preliminary actionable um, <laughs> preliminary actionable insights uh, in this document, but it's a rare case and only happens when the CRR is based on a sufficient amount of uh, number of participants. And then we have a full review. It's just a sense check with the team. Everyone's going to look at the document to be sure that uh, regarding quality and language, everything fits well. And this is the different steps that we have. Uh, so basically, this is how you create a CIR uh, and engage a dev team with your research. Think uh, Always think of communication and empathy. Devs are looking for ways to create experience that will create emotions for their players. And we as researchers are here to help them achieve this goal. Awesome. Thanks, Joaquin, for walking us through the Critical Insights reader and that process. So we're just going to wrap things up now, and we wanted to leave a lot of time for questions, especially with something like this. But just to kind of summarize it today, we've talked about two tools. We've talked about research nuggets and critical insights readers. So we started by talking about nuggets. These are, again, those kind of bite-sized video clips or thick description and video format that exist to engage teams and connect dev teams to their players. It's used to kind of give voice to the key findings and make sure that the dev team is hearing it from the player themselves, not just from the researcher. These should stick with the teams, kind of engaging them and leaving an impression. And generally, we found these easier to use, just to mention it, when we were embedded actually in the teams and working for that same company, uh, also because of anonymization and data privacy policies. So this was more of part of an internal dev team. And then we have the Critical Insights Reader. That's that second tool that Joaquin just talked about. It's kind of a brief top line document. It's meant to be crafted with a lightweight analysis of initial findings. It's really about things that stand out immediately, point to those obviously critical themes that are coming up whenever you're doing a study. And this serves to kind of pique curiosity and to build trust. So research nuggets make things more digestible and engaging. Critical Insights Readers show that you can deliver quickly as well as kind of pique curiosity for that fuller study. These 
Critical Insights readers, just to mention, worked especially well for us now working as a vendor. So with both of these tools in hand, uh, we're confident, pretty, pretty confident that you're going to be able to increase engagement with your clients, stakeholders, teams. And that's the goal for this entire thing is to just build trust and help people make better game experiences. So that's all for uh, the presentation. Thanks so much for your time. And yeah, any questions? It's a great question. So the question was in that initial building the relationship stage, uh, do too many negative clips or negative uh, findings kind of impact the relationship? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, I think it's really important just as researchers to balance the message that you're sending over. Now, if an experience is totally broken and it's absolutely awful, there's not much you can do to kind of hide that there were, was no redeemable quality about it. But one thing that we do, it's pretty standard, is kind of like that, you know, sandwich of it, as it were, like the good, then here's the not so good, then here's the good, but people really liked the, the concept. So that's also how we worked with those nuggets. Uh, usually in a presentation, I would have kind of like a celebratory moment to start and then dive into the kind of critical findings, especially whenever things were really broken in experiences. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Great question. So the question was, how much does this change based on the number of participants? Uh, not that much, to be really honest with you. And again, it's because the nuggets are not the data. The nuggets are representing the data, right? So we would work with a lot of different sample sizes. Uh, I actually had a lot of fun um, mining the nuggets whenever we had really large play tests at EVE Online. I will say it's more work. But one thing that any good moderator is going to be doing or any good researcher is actually during the sessions already taking notes of, oh, that seems like a good good finding or that's a kind of critical point to bring up. So actually, my notes are filled furiously whenever I'm doing research now with timestamps or like, oh, it's 5 p.m. I got to mark that down so I know when to go back to that. Yeah. Yes. So I'll repeat the question and give it over to Joachim, which was, uh, and if I got it wrong, please correct me. Basically, so it's meant to be quick, the critical insights reader. What is the kind of actual timeline between data closing, critical insights reader, then full report, right? Um, to answer that, um, usually we we have a three day. So once the data started to come in, we are usually send the document, the first CIR to three to four days and then a week after we are going to deliver the report but depending on the project we are trying to keep that timeline pretty strict so always sending that document over in three to four days and the document the full report a week after but it depends on how long it took us at first to collect the full data so if you're something thinking something basic like a basic <laughs> concept a study for instance can be two weeks two weeks and a half for something longitudinal it can be up to three to four weeks depending yeah yeah, right here. So I'll try to summarize that question, uh, which was uh, basically depending on the stakeholders, sometimes you don't actually have that timeline to work with, right? So you don't have the three days initially, then the week after to deliver the report. So how do you actually figure out what to even put in a document like that? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, I'll, I'll give my take and that I'd love to hear what Joachim has to say as well. Uh, my take is that Oftentimes as researchers, we can we, we need to work with the experiences we have and trust the intuition we have to find those critical moments, right? And one thing we always do with this ERR is we always, and we didn't talk about this, set up a research brief ahead of time so that we're all on the same page about what is it that we're doing this study for and what are our key questions. And the CIR often addresses those key questions specifically. So uh, we have that kind of you know learning plan, research brief, whatever you want to call it, where you've already agreed upon what the study is meant to find. And then the CIR will always report back on that kind of take. Uh, but that's my take. What's yours? I think it's also important to communicate with the stakeholders, uh, depending on the study that you're going to work on, um, th that the timeline can be something important. Also, I think it's clear to have that um, we are going to live your high quality documents and we are already delivering that in three to four days. So what can we do? What do what is the need here? I think it's important to also talk about that. Yeah, from online. 
why I want to make a clip of this nugget, especially when the same issue happens multiple times, aka why choose one good clip over another good clip? It's a great question. I'll repeat it. So it's why choose one clip over another clip? Like what makes a good nugget? Uh, so what makes a good nugget for me is where it's really explicit, whatever the hurdle was or the celebratory moment. Uh, we have these moments where you can kind of, as the observer, especially in a study, see, oh, we see what's going on there. But what we do a lot is have people, of course, thinking aloud while they're play, playing, uh, answering questions. You saw that clip that we did. We're actually walking through and having the player think aloud about the moment that they're doing. And there are some players who are better at that than others, to be really candid. And I think the good clips, the good nuggets are coming from those players who uh, also uh, speak to it a little bit more explicitly. Now, there's something I didn't mention, and this is uh, just a personal mission of mine, is that I actually, especially with EVE Online, which is notorious for having an, an extremely men-dominated uh, population, would actually try to include nuggets from women a lot, uh, to just to diversify the perspectives that the game team is working with, so they can understand that, hey, this hurdle is happening for this group of people as well. So trying to also include that, I think, makes a good nugget too. So making sure that they're hearing from the voice of their players, but maybe introducing new perspectives. Uh, yeah, we'll do another online one first. Is the sample CIR, Critical Insights Reader, available somewhere? Uh, right now, no, <laughs> but we're happy to share that out. Absolutely. Uh, I think I saw, yeah, a question back there. Yeah, so the question is, uh, how do we actually hand over that CIR to stakeholders? Uh, great question. So normally what we do is uh, we we have multiple different communication platforms. It depends on the client and on the stakeholder, right? Some of them, it's as simple as we post it in a shared Slack channel. So, hey, guys, here's your CIR. Um, that's usually for folks that we've worked with a fair bit. Uh, the first time we ever hand over a CIR, we often will actually pull people into like just a 15-minute call, something really brief, if that's possible, and say, hey, here's the CIR. We just want to go through it really quickly with you because this is a new document for you. Here's kind of what this is meant to do. If you have any questions, let us know. We can talk through that first one. And then afterwards, we just generally hand them straight over to the client via email, Slack, whatever communication platform is available. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, so the question was, how do you do nuggets and work with nuggets for more large scale work like surveys, especially whenever it's with a global population? This actually gets into what I was talking about with the uh, thick description aspect of things. I don't have a great answer to be really candid when it comes to survey work, how to turn that into nuggets. They're really meant to be specifically used where in sessions where you've got recordings or you're able to really record the moment ethnographically. I would say with survey data, what you can always pull out are kind of key quotes if you're doing open-endeds, right? And kind of tie those actually into a document more like the CIR where you're saying, hey, here's the key things we're already discovering with this survey here, kind of those key moments. That's probably how I'd work with survey data. Do you have a different take? No, it's too easy. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, from online. How long does the critical insights reader typically take? Does it slow down the process of the actual yeah, so the question is, how long does this uh, critical insights reader actually take? Does it slow down the process of the report? Um, it usually takes, let's say, two, a couple of days to, to create. Uh, it doesn't slow down the process as we are working, as we are multiple researchers working on the same projects most of the time. Uh, we are making sure that it doesn't impact the full timeline, of course, and we are always making sure that this document is going to give something valuable to the team. So this is the time that we need to take to craft it, and it's going to be very useful. Yeah, just to add a little bit of color to that, so just getting into the timeline, uh, we build that into our research timelines usually, uh, and it also doesn't slow it down so much as it actually helps. So, I mean, one of the things you're doing when you're analyzing data is looking for those key themes, those critical insights, those moments, right? And the critical insights reader helps us as researchers actually to hone in on, you know, those 
key observations that we already are pulling into uh, the, the overall report. It's actually also very useful. So one thing that Joaquin mentioned, just to highlight that again, is it helps get ahead of any questions that exist in the data. So, hey, we're seeing this. Uh, that's unexpected. Could you give us a little bit more of an explanation? And that helps us actually in the full report to build out a more solid holistic answer. So where it does add time is maybe like a, a day of extra work, but it, it's well worth that extra work in our experience. And again, this is specifically as a vendor, it's really useful in that, that kind of space. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, has the addition of clips and nuggets into the report ever made it difficult to share it? So I'm going to ask actually a, a question back. Are you, is this a question about like file size or specifically sharing it over? The file size, yes, it makes these things huge. Uh, and that is a really good point. Uh, I think I, I actually was looking at an old report, looking from my nuggets, and it's it's not a long report. It's like, I think, 15 slides, and it's it's ridiculous how large that that is. There's a lot of uh, solutions in that space to like scaling down the video size as well as how to embed it. Actually, what you saw us do now is the, the solution we often go for, which is we put it into a Google Drive and then just pull that into Google Slides. That makes it much more shareable as well, and it also lives in a cloud space, which is a bit more secure than an actual file. I think there was a question from online. Send a pre meeting clip. Are the devs, um, are the devs launching mobile or desktop? Wondering about vertical. That's a great question. So the question is, if you're sending a pre-meeting clip, are the devs watching mobile or desktop? Um, usually they would be watching on their phones. Uh, usually it's something like a Slack message and a shared channel of, hey, here's just a really interesting pre-insight. Um, again, we actually go from nuggets, sending those over initially to CIRs because that was how we actually created engagement. Uh, thinking about the vertical uh, nature of clips, I never ran into this problem, so I don't I don't have an answer. I mean, I guess people would just turn their phones and watch the clip that way. Um, but it's mostly about hearing the player's voice. And I'll be honest that like the clip itself does a lot. So watching the pain point is important. But what I found is actually hearing the voice of the player was even more important. They would latch on to what was being said in those clips more than they would latch on to what they saw. Another one from online. That's a multi uh, multi pronged question. So I'll I'll try to tear it apart and answer all of those bits. So the question was basically, what do you do if there's not a single moment but multiple moments that you want to kind of highlight? Uh, and one thing I didn't talk about is we don't ever include just one nugget. Usually there's quite a quite a few. So uh, we would pull moments that are specific to different themes. Now, if you're looking for kind of a moment that happens over time, it's a great question. And we did do this and it would actually still be about 45 seconds. And what I didn't go into, and this is actually why I ended up using Adobe Premiere Pro instead of VLC is Adobe Premiere allows us to actually stitch together those nuggets in a singular clip with transitions. So you can actually see the journey from like, let's say the start of the tutorial, if you're working on that to the middle of the tutorial where the frustration is increasing to the end where they're like, I'm not coming back to this game. This is awful. Uh, now, if you have VLC player and you're trying to do that, I would just create mini nuggets and kind of stitch them together and like, hey, here's step one in the journey. Here's step two. Here's step three. So that's probably how I would do that. To, to add a bit to that, when we're having multiple interesting nuggets, we usually capture a lot of them. And what we do is that we select the best one from for the presentation or to show the dev team. And we also store the other ones saying to the dev team, we have other clips presenting that hurdle. We just thought it was better to show you this one. And then we just give them access to a folder where they can look at the other type of nuggets that we have crafted. I think we have time for one more question if there is one. Yeah, from online. All good. What's the difference between the CIR and an executive summary? Is it even more streamlined mm. or that it comes ahead of rather than with the report? Yeah, this is a really good question. Uh, what's the difference between the CIR and executive summary? Very little, actually. Uh, they're very similar in their purpose, but it's just that you're delivering that ahead of time. Uh, the other thing, too, with an executive summary is an executive summary, right? So the CIR is those initial findings, what's critical, what we already know that we've already stumbled across, whereas your exec summary really should be a summary of the report and the findings. At least that's my take on it. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much for the time. If you have any other questions, feel free to find us afterwards.